Uh, I was in the first infantry division, okay. In, in the infantry, I was, uh, you can see this pin there, it's a blue spader. That was the name of the first battalion of the 26th infantry. As a matter of fact, when I was there, Alexander Hay was my battalion commander in 1966-67. He was only a lieutenant colonel back then, okay. And he did move, I will say, he moved up very fast. And then, uh, let's see, uh, well, actually, the purple heart pin, and this little pin here is my aviation pin, okay, super premium, which is Latin for above the first, okay, when I got into aviation. And then, um, here, and actually, this is the combat inf infantryman's badge, okay, which you receive for being a frontline infantryman, all right, and then actually the wings, because I flew, okay, and this is the Vietnam, uh, the flag in the year 68, because I was wounded in, si in 68, so they're the main ones I usually have. Where did you grow up? I grew up in a place called Stonehurst Hills, which is a part of Upper Darby Township, that's in Delaware County, and it's the first suburb of West Philadelphia, in a row house, all homes were row homes basically back then, in a very Irish, Italian, Catholic neighborhood. The neighborhood was, uh, it was a great place to grow up back then in the, uh, in, in the 50s and uh, during the 60s. Uh, we lived right next to what they call a second world playground and they always had big events there. You know, all the parades uh, for Memorial Day, 4th of July, they used to do a very big bash and everything. And then, you know, Veterans Day and uh, most of the people there were World War II veterans and just really liked the military. Uh, I read a lot about it, researched it, and just, you know, growing up watching all those war films and everything, and I wanted to make it a career. I just really enjoyed it, so. And then I graduated and went in uh, right away. I enlisted uh, when well, I was still a senior, and graduated, uh, matter of fact, graduated June the 12th, and I went in the next day, June the 13th. I uh, wanted to leave right away. You're the uh, son of a widowed mom. So you, you didn't give that any thought? No, no, my father was a World War II veteran, and, uh, got wounded pretty seriously and died service connected when I was only seven years old. He died in 1956. So I was the only surviving son. I didn't have to go, but I wanted to go. And, uh, you know, my mother said, fine, I just kind of talked to her and, and things like that. Because I was still 17. My birthday wasn't until November. So when I went in in June, she had to sign. I originally wanted to go into aviation, okay, when I was growing up. And I could have got an appointment to either West Point or the Academy on account of my father. But when I got glasses as a freshman, I knew I could never get into aviation. So I decided to go eventually maybe Airborne, uh, Ranger, Green Beret, which you could do wearing glasses as long as your vision was decent enough. Mine wasn't that bad, you know, with, with glasses back then. But I went to Vietnam. I was going to put that off, so I went over straight leg infantry. You mentioned your father was uh, injured in World War II? Yes. And he suffered severe injuries? Yeah, he, he was a combat uh, little bear medic, okay, because he was an optician. So when he enlisted, he enlisted right after uh, Pearl Harbor. And actually with that background, that they put him in the medical field. And he was older. I mean, he was born in 1916. So when he went over to the South Pacific in 42, he was 26 years old, which was a little bit older. I mean, the World War II were a little bit older than us Vietnam guys, not by much, okay? on the average age. And you gotta remember, he's a, grew up in South Philly and uh, you know, he's only like five foot seven and uh, overweight and smoking them camels and uh, lucky strikes all his life. So he, he had a lot of, uh, it really aggravated any health problems he had. And then he was injured uh, pretty bad, spent a couple months in Australia recuperating and just had a very bad heart from it. And uh, he had bad blood clots uh, for bitis and all that, which we didn't have the drugs back in the 50s that we have today and that's what eventually gave him a heart attack and he passed away. Vietnam, out of all the people that, that served, 75% of us volunteered. Only 25% were drafted and sent there, okay? Most of the guys volunteered because that's what we did. You know, we were the World War II generation. It was our turn, okay? And back then the military was, you know, a very prestigious thing to do. Well, after nine months of being in the infantry, I tell you, I was looking for an adventure when I enlisted. I sure got one. And I was very young when I went over. I was the youngest guy in country when I got there. You had to be 18 to go over in 66. Johnson uh, signed an executive order in the spring of the summer. There were actually 12 legitimate 17 year olds killed in Vietnam. And I guess, you know, with everything going on starting in, in 66, he was getting too much, I guess, flack from, from people. So he said you had to be 18. So when I went over, my birthday's November, and I left right after my 18th birthday. So I was only 18, eight days when I got there at this, at this place called the 93rd Replacement Town outside of Long Bend. Because they told me that when I landed, because they said, hey, Clay, you're the youngest guy in the country today. You have no duty for 24 hours. So in the military, I was like, hey, it's a day off. You don't have to go feel sandbags or dig holes. And uh, 
So uh, that, that's why, so I, I got into the infantry. I got assigned to the 1st Infantry Division a week later. And a couple weeks later, I'm out on an operation. And then on New Year's Day was my first action. It was a night ambush. So that was a, a welcome to Vietnam uh, very quickly. Uh, I was on two big operations, Cedar Falls and Junction City in 67, okay? And it was a little bit there. My battalion got in a very big ap, uh, action on March 31st and April 1st of 67, but I was back in the base camp. I was, got sent back there for a couple weeks, and then uh, I, w I went out after that. So I did have some skirmishes, firefights, but it was not nothing major that I would consider. And after being in the infantry and living out in the jungle, I decided to get into aviation uh, from flying in helicopters and being around them. I really enjoyed that. And they were living a lot better than we were out in the infantry, so I transferred into being a helicopter door gunner. And I got sent down to the gunship platoon because I didn't want to fly slicks, as they call them. I wanted to get on guns. And I started flying uh, September 1st of 67 and flew uh, up until I got wounded in 68. Well, when I got in, uh, I, I got on the ship and, and got assigned a helicopter where a crew was assigned where the pilots used to rotate. They never flew the same helicopter every day. So I flew that uh, until Christmas and then I got a free 30 day leave because I extended. If you want to be a door gunner, you extend it. And I was going to stay in Vietnam because, like I said, I thought eventually it might come to a truce. And I liked the, I liked the, du the duty over there. So I come home for Christmas of uh, 67, went back uh, January 68. And then during the Tet Offensive hit, January 30th, 31st. And so we used to fly a lot of um, cover missions for medevacs. Medevacs flew unarmed over there. They, they had no weapons, okay? Only the, uh, the pilots would carry a personal weapon. And uh, they had a crew chief, and then they would always fly with a medic. And they had that big red cross on the door and on the front of that. So Charlie used to wait for those if they attacked the enemy for them to come in because the UEs we had with the Lycoming T-53 engines and everything were all a little underpowered, especially in that heat and humidity. And if you ever remember, if you ever saw the films how the helicopters would kind of always try to get off like this. Well, when they'd land, they'd load them up with the wounded and everything. So the enemy used to wait till they tried to get up right above the tree line and then try to shoot the whole helicopter down and get everybody. So as gunships, we used to, we used to go out and we'd fly around the area and basically shoot up the area to keep their head down so they could get the medevac in and get it out. And that's how I got wounded. We were at a place called Tuda, which is probably about 20 miles north of Saigon. And uh, so as we were going in, the Saigon River was right there. It's very wide and very essy, probably about as, not as wide as the Delaware, but just about. And, and with all the jungle and the growth and the elephant grass on the sides. And they were hiding in all that as we came in and made a, I'm on the left door, I was a left door gunner. And as we're making a big left-hand sweep, we're 500 feet high, we're doing like 90 knots because we're looking. And all of a sudden, they just opened up on us. We never saw them. And we'd open up with automatic weapons fire, a couple machine guns. Uh, we took a 12.7, which is basically their Chinese 51 caliber. It's the same size as our 50. Went right through the windscreen, missed the pilot in front of me, went out. And then we took a lot of small arms fire. The helicopter took 24 hits. And I got hit a couple times because I was just hanging out the door and it just happened so quickly that I couldn't get up back in, round through the leg, I took one through the hand, I had a flight helmet on, it hit the helmet and kind of just creased my head, just, just kind of, you know, a couple stitches and I was fine. But the, the leg one was the most serious one. Uh, I, I, uh, it, it was pretty bad. I didn't realize it being 19 years old and, you know, not knowing anything about medicine. But Well, a after I got back to the hospital, uh, the, my aircraft commander, Don Arich, he pulled us out, okay, and because uh, we went down a couple hundred feet, he pulled us out. And we weren't that far from the hospital. It's a place called the 93rd Evac at Long Bend. And we were on the same radio as the uh, medevac. So when we called in, the, he had a gunner hit. The medevac said, because we didn't know what a hospital basically was. We never flew there. So we followed the medevac into the, into the hospital. And when I got there, they got me off. And then they got me in uh, prep for surgery. Uh, even though the wound was pretty bad with what it did to my leg, it missed all naturally any arteries. Otherwise, I'd have bled out on a helicopter uh, if it would have hit the main femoral artery in my leg. So they got me there, they got me prepped up, and then they just took me into surgery. I remember I had a watch on like I have now, and I went around through my hand, it hit the watch and it was kind of hanging off. And when you flew, you had to fly with all your uniform down, buttoned up, and you had to fly with flight gloves. So when my crew chief put me on the floor to take his belt to make a tourniquet, I kind of pulled my watch around and I get it at 2.20 in the afternoon. And at quarter after three, I was wheeled into the operating room. They had a big, uh, I was on the stretcher and they had a uh, clock above the operating room and I looked up at it and it was quarter after three. So within an hour, I was in major surgery. And then um, 
when I woke up, I was in skeletal traction, okay? Because if you break your femur, that, that puts you in traction, where it keeps your legs straight and everything. So I don't remember too much because I had you, uh, from the anesthesia, I was out for about five hours. And then they gave me a shot of, uh, Demerol was very big over there. They gave me a shot of that and that put me right out till uh, the next day. And then I spent um, a week there and then they flew me to uh, Japan. I was in a hospital total of 21 months to, from the day I got shot, February 19th of 68, and I was released in the Philadelphia VA Hospital on November 19th of 1969. But uh, I went to Japan, and uh, when you break your femur, they have to put you in a full body cast because it's connected to your hip, and they have to put you totally in plaster so you don't move, otherwise the bone will move. And then when I got to Japan, I was in this huge cast, and they weren't going to do anything for me there. They just said, okay, you'll be here. We're going to get you right to the States. There's nothing they can do. But after a couple of days, I picked up a very bad hematoma. Apparently, I hematomatized after surgery, which is like blood clots, okay? And they thought I had gangrene, and they cut me out of the cast, and they were going to amputate my leg. So when they took me into surgery, the doctor said, look, we think you have this, okay? We don't know. And basically, you'll know when you wake up. Because if you have gangrene, you know, you, you, it's stuff, it's, there's still no cure for it. You'd be dead in 24 hours with this. And if it gets infected in your bloodstream, they say, we're going to take your leg off. And if not, you know, uh, if you don't have it, we'll save it. So I woke up, and, and then he told me the, which, what I had and everything like that. And I still have my leg. And usually the uh, psychiatrist, he would come around, and he would have your chart and your x-rays, and he would kind of explain to you. And also he would interview to make sure that you're psychologically okay. We had a couple guys on the ward that were amputees, burnt, things like that, and they psychologically, they weren't taking it too well. I mean, so he, he, he was around like to try to calm them down and everything. And then they told me what they would do, and they said, we have this thing called controlled shortening, uh, because I was missing about three and inches of my femur, which is blown out. I mean, it just, it just was gone. So they said, we're going to let your legs shorten up, and then we're going to bone graft your whole left iliac crest, your hip bone here, okay, onto your leg because they said we couldn't plate or pin me back then. There was nothing to do it to. We have to bone graft. If you don't get this disease called osteomyelitis, it's a bone disease. If it takes, you don't get that, then you'll be fine. You'll have about a half a knee. You'll be short your orthopedic shoes. If not, if you get any infections, then we're going to have to amputate, and, you know, and, and you know, we'll give you an artificial leg, and, and you'll be out. But uh, because of the um, wanting to save it, that's why I spent so long. I spent 19 months at a hospital call. Valley Forge Medical Center, which is outside of Phoenixville, which is a suburb of Philadelphia. And so I was there for 19 months until I was discharged. That's one of the things I guess they don't really talk about. I and mean, you got to remember, we were young, 18, 19, 20, and basically, you know, most states had to be 21 to drink back here. So we got to Vietnam. I mean, beer came in 16 ounce cans, it was 10 cents a piece in the club. The shots were 25 cents. You had a ration card. You were allowed three bottles of liquor and I used to drink scotch. And I remember J and B. Now we're in metric because we're out of the country. So you could get a liter for a dollar five. Matter of fact, when I got wounded, because I was on what they call first standby that day. Okay, so you either be out on the flight line at your helicopter or back in the barracks. Well, naturally we wanted to be away from any rank you know, any sergeants or other officers. So we would always hang out in the flight line, and out in the flight line, we snuck out, we had beer out there, we would take it out and things like that. So I'm sitting around like, just throwing down a couple of six packs and everything like that. And then, you know, a lot of the pilots used to do Jack Daniels and everything. So a lot of times we used to keep it in the helicopter, just keep a bottle in the helicopter and things like that. So when I went out, we got scrambled out about two o'clock in the afternoon, because again, like I said, I got hit at like 2.20. I was a little bit inebriated uh, when I got hit. Uh, matter of fact, it was funny when I was laying on the operating table when they got me in. Here I am, I'm all stripped naked. They get me in the operating room. And the operating room was air conditioned. It was kind of chilly. And I'm laying there, and, and it must have been my gas passer. He must have, I must have belched out or did something because they're ready to operate on me. The doctor's standing there with a scalpel and they're ready to go, and the nurse is shaving me. And it, it kind of must have belched out because they're getting ready, I guess, to put me out and then tube me and things like that. And he says, is that alcohol? And he didn't, and he didn't know my name. And they remember when I got hit, they, when I got to the hospital, they took my dog tag and they took one and they taped it to my arm with like clear tape. So I guess they wouldn't lose me. And he reaches over and he goes, Clay. And I said, I said, you look at yesterday. He says, is that alcohol you've been drinking? And I go, well, yes, sir. And the nurse was funny. She said, well, he never said that. Cause when I got in their interview and they asked me what I ate. And I said, I had breakfast and I ate lunch about 12 o'clock. And things like, how much did I? I said, I ate a lot. And uh, 
So I, I said, well, she never asked me if I had anything to drink, you know, and I said, what you have? And I said, well, some six packs and maybe a little bit of Jack Daniels. And he just, you could see his eyes rolling in his head going, I can't believe you're drinking Jack at two in the afternoon. I said, well, what can I say, sir? And that was it. And then the next thing I know, they, they put me out and then, uh, like I said, when I woke up, I was tubed, you know, they tube you up through your nose down into your stomach. And then I remember waking up and they pulled the tubes out of me and stuff like that to make sure I was awake. And, and that, that, that was it. That's how I uh, kind of woke up from that. And, okay, basically, the military lived on two things back then. He, they drank coffee from 5 o'clock from the time they got up to, say, 4 in the afternoon. That's when the club would open up, okay, either in the States or back in Germany, you know, overseas or definitely in Vietnam. And then it was just like beer and whiskey and alcohol all night long, okay. Uh, it was very accessible, all right. Uh, every base had clubs and bars. You could get it. You had a ration card. You're allowed to buy so many cases of beer, I think it was four or five a month. And these are all 16 ounce cans, and it was 10 cents. So a case of beer was $2.40. Uh, we're out of the country, so everything's metric. So you could get a liter of scotch. I remember I used to drink JMB, that was my favorite. And it was a dollar five. And I know as an enlisted guy, I could get three bottles a month. So there was a lot of alcohol abuse here. People drank. It was a term over there. You were either a juicer, or you drank, or called a head when you got back into base camp. And naturally, you're on the camp, if you were smoking, you had to get away from everybody because of that sweet smell. They did have MPs, they did have patrols and things like that. And if you got caught, you were going to get court-martialed, you know, or at least in Article 15, which is this non-judicial punishment, or if you had a lot, you know, and did something stupid, you could wind up in, in, in jail, getting sent to jail. So it, it, was, it's, it was a little bit there, as I noticed, and I think it got worse naturally after Tet in 68 and 69 to 70s when Nixon was in pulling people out. You know, I, I think the drug use got a, a little bit more worse. I don't think it was as crazy as the press per, per, portrayed it. I know, you you know, the Vietnamese would, could get you heroin and sell it. When we got back, nobody talked about it, okay? And it, nobody said anything. I mean, uh, you know, people come back, they just, uh, you know, grew their hair long, which I never did. But, uh, you know, it, it just nobody wanted to talk about it and things like that. You only talked about it if you knew somebody was there. You would say something like, what'd you do and things like that. Who are you with? Like I had friends I went to high school with. You know, one friend of mine was in the artillery, okay? Uh, a couple of the guys were out in the field. And you would kind of mention that and things like that. But nobody, nobody wanted to... Uh, to talk about it. It's the, the way the press did us. I mean, you come to the 70s you, and everybody thinks you were this psychotic, whacked out baby killer, okay, which is not true. I mean, it was just the biggest fallacy over there. And especially after My Lai hit. I mean, that was one isolated incident that, that really just that blew up in the 70s. And uh, I'll tell you an interesting story. It was funny. When I, when I was in the hospital all that time, I put on a lot of weight. I was probably 150 pounds when I got shot. When I got discharged, I was 240. Because I'm sitting around just in this body cast, okay, and from the operations and everything to put me back together and lay around the hospital bed, and I just ate a lot and drank. So when I got out, I was I was heavier, uh, and again, I wear orthopedic shoes with, with the lift on the bottom of the shoe, you know, so it makes up for the difference so I can walk straight. And a lot of times I remember, you know, hanging out in the 70s up on what they call the Gold Mile, Baltimore Pike, and a lot of girls or meet or women, if you said anything about you're a Vietnam veteran, they'd have, some of them would have nothing to do with you unless they knew you, okay? And a lot of times the girls would say something and they'd see the thing and I wouldn't say anything and I'd go, oh, I had polio. Because remember, we grew up with that. We didn't get the polio vaccine until we were, I think, in first or second grade. So that was a common thing back then, you know, and things like that. So I had, I had a polio and things like that. If You know, you didn't know if you weren't there, was the old saying, and, and what went on. So I would just kind of say that once in a while, and I wouldn't really ad admit it, you know. And, and that never really happened until... Uh, first of all, I think the worst thing that ha happened to us is the Rambo movie. I mean, when that happened. And that happened right around when Reagan's Noble Cause speech came out. Nobody talked about being a veteran until Ronald Reagan, I think it was the 84, 85, State of the Union, come up with the Noble Cause, and he had the Medal of Honor recipient in, 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 the, in the audience, and, every, and uh, next thing you know, boom, everybody's a Vietnam veteran. And then Rambo comes out, and everybody thinks they want to be Rambo. Right? You know, we were caught up in the Cold War. Remember, we grew up, communism, the Cold War, the domino theory. Which, when you're young, sounded like a viable theory, okay? But they, they knew they should have negotiated with Ho Chi Minh. He had a different mindset. He did come to this country in the 50s after Dien Bien Phu, which was May of 54, after he beat the French and tried to make a deal with us. But because of the whole communist thing and the Dulles brothers who ran the CIA and the State Department, 
when Eisenhower, they would ju just not negotiate with him, even though it's not a hardcore communist. He was more of a socialist. It's called the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. Uh, I'm a returning veteran. I've been back 10 times. Uh, the people there, you can own businesses, you can own property. You, they have a lot of rights. They have courts, they have laws, they have judges. They even have traffic courts in that country, okay, because the traffic does get a little horrendous over there. So it's, uh, it, it wasn't a hardcore like the Chinese with Mao or the Russian government, okay. Why did you go back 10 times? I always wanted to see the place. It's a very, it was a very beautiful, okay, that part of Southeast Asia. And being 18 and 19 there, and I always just liked the place. And then I just wanted to go back because basically that's where I spent my youth. From there, and then, you know, being in the hospital. I went in at 17, went over to right at 18, got wounded, and I got out of the hospital three days after my 21st birthday. So that's basically where I spent what I consider, you know, my, my main youth from 17 to 21. And I just wanted to go back and tour the country. And I started doing a tour the first time and going back on my own. I've taken veterans back. I've taken both of my pilots back, a couple other door gunners that wanted to go back and I would take them so we could go back to see the area and what it's like now. It's all been uh, redeveloped. I mean, you can't even tell we were there. I've toured up north. Uh, Quezon is gone. It's just a coffee plantation up there. The whole marine area is gone. Way's all been rebuilt. Western part of Vietnam, up in the Cambodia and Laos and things like that. There's still a lot of jungle and area, and they're still pretty good-sized countries. And to hunt for people like that is, uh, you know, I think most of them went missing are, are are those people. As a matter of fact, the first tour I went in, I flew into Hanoi, because back when I went back in '97, you could only get a 30-day visa. So I wanted to go north to south. I was on a three-week tour, and then I had a week where I could. Um, get a car, you're not allowed to drive there, you're in a car, it comes with a driver. Because I wasn't stationed far from Saigon, I was right north of here with the 1st Division, and I wanted to go up to see where I was at, where the old bases were. So now you're going to, you went on to become an actor. Did you take any acting lessons? Yeah, when I was doing theater here, it wasn't that bad, it was, um, uh, you know, pretty amateur, it was nice, I mean, there were a couple semi-professionals. And then when I moved out to L.A. Uh, full-time, I went to an acting, acting school out there, and took lessons and basically learned some technique, basically how to audition, okay, how to work camera and everything like that, because TV and film are much different than, than being a stage actor. And I got my uh, Screen Actors Guild card. I was out there about six months and I got my card. I looked out and met a guy that was a producer for ABC and he was in Vietnam doing news back then and he, he got me in to get my union card and from that I got an agent and I started doing a couple commercials in the late 70s and then so from that, eventually uh, got into some network television. As a sideline, I never made a lot of money as an actor. I'd still be out there. I had limousines in Beverly Hills for close to eight and eight and a half years, almost nine years out at a Beverly Wilshire Hotel with a company called Carey Limousine. So we had a lot of big star clients, you know, and things like that. And uh, matter of fact, the big client was Johnny Carson. And I probably seen the Tonight Show. I don't know how many times and and things like even they're scripted. They, the, the people they interview you before and they what are you going to ask things like that. Even game shows are written, talk shows are written. You got to remember it's television. They can't have people go. Well, they ask you and they go like huh? like that. They can't have what they call dead air. I mean, so they kind of get you going, you know. And, and the interviews have to know how like you do to keep the um, interview going, so you don't have that dead air on television. The first network show I ever did, I remember, was The Fall Guy with, with Lee Majors. That was my first show. I had a little part in that. Uh, I had a great part on um, uh, Mike Hammer, Stacey Keach. You know, I played as a civil veteran. And that's my only national TV show where I think about myself. And I get killed in that. They, they want to actually get him. And I go to his apartment. And actually, you know, the apartment blows up. And I happen to be in there and things. And the rest of the show is him trying to find who got me, you know. I got hired for the Golden Girls, okay, and to pay a... The, the play I like this cake delivery guy. It was supposed to be your mother's Estelle's birthday. I'm supposed to come in with this big sheet cake, okay? And we're rehearsing the final night, okay? Because they shot it, this is Thursday, they shot it Friday and they shot live audience do 5.30 and 8 o'clock on a half hour show. And it's shot, don't, you don't break. All the sets are in a long line on, 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 in the sound stage, okay? And the cameras just go, boom. So they had like the lanai, the living room, the bedroom, boom, boom. It's just on a long line and you would just go from set to set. And keep and, and keep it running. It's like a play, okay? And you just shoot it. And if you mess up afterwards, the audience leaves. Then you do what they call pickups, where you redo your dialogue because maybe you messed up a line or they didn't hear you right to sound people. So I come in the final night, and you have your marks on the floor and everything like that. It's a three camera sitcom, I think, three or four camera. And I kind of tried to, I try to, up, I upstage a little bit. I wanted to get like this is a it's a top ten show. It's the mid '80s. This is like I want my face right on the screen. I'm like, hey, look who's on the Golden Girls. And she got a little not happy with what I did and 
complained to the director and had we had a little had a little screaming match and put me in my place and I got up the next day and my agent called me and said, wow, he made some excuse about the show and everything like that. And uh, a friend of mine happened to have another part in the show and I talked to him on Saturday. He said, uh, B was a little mad at you and she uh, told the writers to fire me and uh, write me out of the show. Yeah, I, I, I had a nice part in Scarecrow and Mrs. King, okay, uh, when that show was on. I think I did that back in 87 and uh, I played a, uh, uh, a, a guy that owns this hospital looking for this CIA has got this covert hospital where they're hiding people and I and I played they're trying to find information and things like that and I had a nice uh, three page scene whatever and everything like that but again I was told when I went into wardrobe I knew the wardrobe guy I did a movie the week with him a couple years before and he he said uh, and my shot was Monday morning first thing another on the set at seven o'clock at Warner Brothers on Monday because we shot outside on the back line and he said let me tell you about Kate around he said she's very professional she's very tough on actors you know, uh, you know, she hates these long days, you know, doing 14, 15 hours a day, make sure you're prepared. Otherwise she could go a little ballistic on you, you know what I mean? So she'll let you know right away. So make sure you got your lines down, you're prepared, you know what you're doing, you know what I mean? Hit your marks when they come out and show you, you know, where your marks are. And so I did it, I did the whole thing in the, in the, uh, one mass, one mass taken taking one little close up. So I was done. We did the whole shot probably in 15 minutes. She was real pleased with that. She, she told me that she goes, it was very nice to have prepared actors at seven 30 in the morning, you know, to go out and shoot this thing. And, uh, after I left, uh, I'm a traveler. I really like to travel. So, uh, I mean, it was nice, but you know, I got tired of basically going out for three lines and things like that. And I, I don't know if my career was ever going to go anywhere. Otherwise I'd still be out there. And, uh, and I just got, I sold everything out and I um, left and run around the world for 13 months. Had a great time, sold everything out and uh, told mom here, hold my stuff, hold the mail and uh, you know, I'll see you when I get back. Thank you. Okay. Welcome home. Thanks, appreciate it.